Hey everybody, happy 2023. Uh, it looks like this is a thing that I do every year now, so I guess we just get to it. This year, or I should say last year, 2022, I read 35 books. I used to try to do it 52 books to get through one a week, but it sort of became an obligation, so if I found myself running low, I'd sort of read Old Man in the Sea to just get my count up, and I didn't want to do that. I love Old Man in the Sea, no knock on that, but I'd start fitting in shorter books that I didn't necessarily want to read, and sometimes I want to read longer books. So guess what happened? This year I read 35 books, and here they are in the order in which I read them, and I'm going to go fast, so buckle up. Here we go. Seeds of Earth, Songs of Starlight, The Tao of Statistics, World War Z, An Oral History of the Zombie War, Dreaming in Cuban, Man's Search for Meaning, Moon Witch, Spider King, Harlem Shuffle, Paradise Lost, The Grief Recovery Handbook, A Book of Luminous Things, What Matters Most is How Well You Walk Through the Fire, The Sparrow, Josephine Baker's Last Dance, Project Hail Mary, Winslow Homer, American Passage, White Tears, Chaos, Blackmailer, Daniel Deronda, Bright Dead Things, The Lincoln Highway, The Daughter of Dr. Moreau, Blood Honey, Russia, Described by Great Writers, Clara and the Sun, Street Trash, The Bhagavad Gita, Devil in a Blue Dress, Second Place, The Passenger, Colorless Tsukuru Tazaki, Moby Dick, Chaucer, Life and Times of the First English Poet, Stella Maris, and Collected Poems of Jack Gilbert. That was the order, and now let's start, and I'll go fast so people aren't bored out of their mind. And in an effort to not bore people, let's start with Moby Dick and Chaucer. Good Lord. Okay, the Chaucer bio was a gift from my son, and those things always have a sentimental value, so I'll start there. Um, I know nothing about Chaucer. I found it actually kind of interesting. A lot of what we regard as literature comes from the stuff that he did and kind of structure and the way that we tell stories. So it is interesting, but also anti-Semitism. Lots of it. I know. Shocking, right? Anyhow, it's interesting. If you're into Chaucer, pick it up. But in this matchup, it's up against Moby Dick, right? On a totally separate note about Moby Dick, I've read this three times before, so it's sort of getting a special note. Um, this time I read it every day, two pages at a time over the course of the whole year, and it's long, and there's lots of passages that are boring as fuck, and a lot of it is also really fucking beautiful, and it's awesome, and I love it. Sorry, I'm a big freaking nerd. So I read it really slowly, two pages a day. I didn't want my eyes to glaze over. I didn't want to make sure that I read all the footnotes and understood all the references, and I really, really, really drank up every little bit of this whole thing and it is amazing and it is great and i still love it way more than i love this chaucer bio so melville you win this round next up is uh <laughs> street trash by the great mike lackey versus second place by the great rachel cusk full disclosure mike lackey is a friend he's an absolute amazing man he was actually in the 1987 film of street trash and this graphic novel has been sort of a passion project for him for a very long time he was a writer at marvel worked on spider-man beavis and butthead uh, among a lot of other things he has an incredible incredible career i met him when we were working in anime at a company called central park media i know that over the pandemic that really gave him a bunch of free time to finish this book it's amazing Every single page and every frame is just filled with inside jokes and gags, and I mean literally gags, because this is a fucking gross, gross, gross-out book. It's part of the gross-out horror movies from the 80s, and it's a special kind of crazy. This novel goes way, way further than the movie did. It is completely offensive to every uh, sensibility and any sane person would ever have, so it's an amazing accomplishment. Skid Row community is plagued by uh, a batch of cut-rate liquor that literally dissolves people who drink it uh, like from the inside out. The central character, this bum, uh, and this insane parade of like prostitutes and pimps and abusive bosses and deformed children and one horrible person after another show up. Uh, it Read it slowly. It's really, really, really fun because every single image is a story by itself. And while I love this book and I love Mike Lackey, I am really sorry, Mike, but you're up against Rachel Cusk. This woman's a fucking genius. I love her work and I will have more on this later, but she wins this one right here. Uh, next one, Color 
colorless Tukuru and his years of pilgrimage versus Stella Maris. Weirdly, in a first round, uh, this is actually a tough one. Um, they're both really great, and they're both really uh, weird and unique. I recommend them both. Stella Maris is actually the second book as part of um, this pair of books released by Cormac McCarthy. Uh, the first one's called The Passenger, and I'll get to that next. That book is about a guy named Bobby Western. deals a lot of things, but a central haunting thing in his life is the suicide of his sister. This book, the one we're talking about, Stella Maris, is the transcript of his sister talking to her doctor at a mental facility before she killed herself. Herself. The mental facility is called Stella Maris. Um, central character, she's 20 years old. She's a completely off the charts genius in anything she tries. She's very, very, very interesting, but there's no plot unless you count the unfolding of ideas. And she gradually sort of reveals her relationship with her brother, which is kind of interesting, especially as a companion piece to the passenger. Uh, on the other hand, Colorless Tsukuru Tsuzaki. I know I'm mangling the pronunciation, but that is a really haunting, really excellent book. Um, I know, Kuru uh, Murakami, again, mangling his name. I apologize. You know, can you believe it? The guy's written like a million books. I've only other read 1Q84, and I loved that book, and I picked this one up, and in this matchup, weirdly, um, I love both of them, but... Uh, um, uh, colorless Tsukuru Tazaki is a better book, I believe. That's the winner. Now on to The Passenger, I mentioned earlier, versus The Collected Poems of Jack Gilbert. Let's start with Jack Gilbert. This was recommended to me by my dear friend, Simona Berman. Um, I did not know this writer at all. Um, his work completely snuck up on me. A lot of it central uh, to his life is his work of dealing with the grief of losing his wife um, and how to carry on and keeping the memories of her alive through his work. But poetry collections can be like a lot. It's like an emotion-only version of somebody's life without any specifics or signposts or context. There's no story. Instead, everything's arranged somewhat chronologically, maybe in a very loose sense, but it's arranged emotionally, which is a totally different way of experiencing someone's life, and that's how you get it. And so it's a lot, and it can be disorienting, but it's well worth it. He's, he's a great writer. On the other hand, The Passenger is literally a book that's like genetically designed for me. I fucking love Cormac McCarthy. I actually wanted to name my son after him. This is about a central character who works as a salvage diver, and he ends up spending a lot of time musing on the philosophical importance of physics and math. Are you kidding me? This is my fucking cup of tea. It's amazing. Cormac McCarthy is well into his 80s and writing with vibrance and passion of a much younger man, but the wisdom of someone his own age. And it is a tough read but it's great. I really, really like this book a lot. All right, we're back to the top for round two. Here we go. Seeds of Earth. Um, this was a gift from my youngest child who is not so freaking young anymore. Anyhow, I've been dabbling with reading this book for years. I sort of dipped my toe into it. And last Christmas, Annika got it for me as a gift. It was incredibly thoughtful and really, really observant that she knew that I'd sort of been sort of dancing around this book for a long time. Anyhow, it's a delightful space romp. It's super exciting. It's filled with alien cultures. There are various gods and myths that end up actually being real and super important to the story uh, and to have an impact on the political outcome and various factions. There's galactic politics, all manner of military fun. It's really, really great, but it's up against Moby Dick, like I said before. Um, read it slow, because... The world is constantly set on fast forward. That's how we live, but that's not how the world was for Melville and his audience. They had no TV. They had no radio. There were no distractions. This was the distraction from life where most readers would never, ever even see the ocean. So to these readers, this was like an incredible journey for them to a totally foreign world. And it's immersive and it can be beautiful if you let it but it really takes time. So that's what I did in 2022, and it was well worth it. Um, so it's definitely going to be the winner here. Um, I'm actually doing a similar thing this year. I'm reading all of Mark Twain over the course of 2023. So I don't know. We'll see how that shakes out next year. Anyhow, in this one, Great White Whale, it wins. But Seeds of Earth was totally fun. Give it a go if you have the wherewithal. Next up, it is White Tears versus a Winslow Homer biography. Let me start with Winslow Homer. I love him. He's one of my favorite painters. Unfortunately, he did not leave a, lead a particularly fascinating life. There's no like love stories. There's no tragic anything going on there. Um, he struggled with his career, but just was really brilliant, stuck to it, and kind of did this whole... I, I was really hoping for insight into his work, but I did not get that. 
Um, so it's not a great book. It, Winslow Homer's a great painter, didn't make a great book. White Tears, on the other hand, man, that one's a ride. I love this book. It's about a couple of white kids who are super into music and they get really into analog stuff, like old school, recording on tape, making vinyl. Um, one of the kids is really rich and his parents fund him as they build a recording studio. They get known for doing analog work um, and they start like collecting lots of different artists that want to work with them because of their sound. And then one day, while out collecting sounds, um, one of them records this guy who's like singing in the park and the rich kid takes that recording, cleans up the audio and releases it as like an old blues wax recording. Well, then things get really weird. Um, it is really the clear winner here, and we'll talk more on it later, so, you know, sit tight, but it's definitely the winner in this, this patching. Um, next one is Blood Honey versus Paradise Lost. Full disclosure, again, Poppy Koval is a friend, and this is her first book. Um, Milton, on the other hand, has been dead for about 350 years, and despite my advanced age, I've never met John Milton. He is not my friend. Blood Honey is what you might call a low-stakes thriller. It's based on an actual thing that happened in Brooklyn, sort of, uh, several years ago, and there's some international tr intrigue, and there's a young protagonist who's thrown into some danger, and let me tell you, Poppy Koval freaking nails what it is like to be a young person struggling in New York at the start of your career, workplace, politics, relationship, insight, etc. She just gets all of that stuff just freaking right, and the plot moves things along. It's kind of low stakes, but I really wish there was just more of the the interactions of the people without the plot, which is sort of a weird thing to say. Um, this was really, really, really great. I loved all of that stuff in this book, um, and I'm really looking forward to her next book. So good for you. Um, and this is stacked against the highest of stakes novel. You know, Satan and God are battling it out in sort of a proxy war and actually an actual war for control of all humanity. And I'm listen, I'm not going to go the whole fucking thing. Um, it's, I'm not picking the best books here. What I'm going to tell you is that I really enjoyed reading Poppy Koval more than I enjoyed reading um, Paradise Lost. My vote, Poppy Koval in this one. It's a light read, but totally fun. And Poppy, put that on your back cover. Quote, unquote, better than Paradise Lost. So you got that. Anyhow, uh, next one is Russia uh, versus Harlem Shuffle. Harlem Shuffle is the easy winner here, but a quick note on um, the Russia book. It was also a gift from Annika, and it was really fascinating, and it was meant to be a travelogue in 1911. So it's documenting Russia before the revolution, before World War I, before World War II, all the stuff that we define Russia by, including the invasion now, but all of that stuff, this was before that. This was a czarist time, and it's an amazing peek into the past, but it's also come completely filled with casual racism and, I know, shocking anti-Semitism. But if you could take it for what it is, it is an interesting window into a time before the whole world changed. Harlem Shuffle, on the other hand, is fucking brilliant. I love this book. Um, it's basically several novellas about a furniture salesman in Harlem who gets mixed up with gangsters and all manner of fascinating characters. Um, it's in the 60s. Do not miss out. This thing is freaking great. Clear winner here. Next, World War Z versus the previous winner's second place. <sighs> Guys, World War Z is great. It really is. It's totally fun. And if you've seen the movie, please forget the movie. It The movie's terrible. The book is wonderful. Um, and I don't like zombie stuff. I think they're a stupid enemy. I really don't like it. But World War Z is like a Studs Terkel book. If you've never read Studs Terkel, stop what you're doing. Go read a Studs Terkel book. And um, it he does oral histories, which is like interviews with people who were actually in place at certain events and he reconstructs history around those things they're like great and this is in that genre it's really hard to put down it's really 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 fun but it's up against second place and i fucking love rachel cusk um this is far more story driven than the trilogy that i read from her last year um, and I loved those books. Um, this book is about a couple that has a second home. Get it? It's their second place. And it's a place where they invite an artist to come and just be. This is a lot about self-examination, uh, looking into relationships, ranking importance. You know, like if you're ranking things, something would be second place. So it's a play on that. Again, 
you prioritize who means what to whom and why and it's it's complicated and it's beautiful and thoughtful and much more story driven than her previous stuff so it it's really a lovely marriage of things i enjoyed both of these books but definitely second place is going to stay with me longer next is the sparrow versus daniel Durando. the sparrow is a sci-fi book with deep religious themes and it's pretty interesting and it is really nicely written here's what happens alien life is confirmed elsewhere and the earth decides to send a jesuit priest and a linguist as part of a mission to go and make contact daniel deronda is the story of a man who's been raised as an upper class nobleman and he discovers that he has uh, jewish roots it's an interesting book it's a very simple sort of concept but the characters are really pretty fascinating it is a long book but I gotta tell you, man, none of it is superfluous. Uh, it's just really incredibly rich. Lots of unexpected stuff, and yeah, it's slow. I mean, it is George Eliot, okay? She wrote in 1875. Nobody reads this book, but people should. It's really beautiful, and it's exquisitely constructed. It's tough for a modern audience, but honestly, it's really great. Really, really great. I didn't love The Sparrow. And it's for a lot of reasons. One, the aliens weren't that alien enough, I guess. Um, the things that were so shocking for our human protagonists are things that we humans do to each other on this planet every fucking day. So I don't know why they were so shocked. I don't know. Whatever. People question their belief in God all the time. And I guess maybe it means more to this guy. And, and there's, a, there's a lot of beautiful writing, a lot of thought-provoking stuff. But in this case, it's Danny D. So not... Sorry, Sparrow. I know you tried. wasn't for me. I don't know what to tell you. Next, on to Poetry Corner. This is Bukowski versus Ada Limon. Um, it's Ada Limon. She wins. Bukowski, really interesting, explosive. I love his stuff. Really, I do. But man, it's really fucking liquor-soaked. And lots of it is super fucking depressing. And you can admire this guy's ability to just keep going and have the courage to lay his life out there and just bleed on the page in all of his brutal, ugly glory. It's really heartbreaking, honesty. But seriously, man, just fucking get some help. Go to a meeting, something. Move forward, evolve. It's just hard to spend that much time deep in that level of alcohol and depression. Ugh. Bright Dead Things, on the other hand, has its fair share of darkness, but honestly, there's just so many moments of I was here. This is a thing from my past. I'm reflecting on it. I'm in a different place now, and I have insight into it, and this is what that is. And there's a lot of that, and it's really beautiful, and it's inspiring, and the imagery is gorgeous, and it's relatable and unexpected, so it's definitely Bright Dead Things for the win. Uh, more depressing title, but a way more inspiring book. There you go. Dreaming in Cuban versus Devil in a Blue Dress. Devil in a Blue Dress is absolutely one of my favorite films. I just think it's an underappreciated masterpiece of noir about race and storytelling, and the Denzel in that movie is at his most Denzel. I fucking love that movie. So, I was really surprised when my very trusted friend Gamal gave this a very mediocre review. So I read it, and yes, it really deserves a mediocre review. Um, the movie is great because of Carl Franklin, who is an underappreciated, just brilliant director. Just watch anything he's made. He is fucking wonderful. I love that guy. And he, you know, if you watch the movie, you also get to see Don Cheadle. And I think what's his first movie? I don't know. He's fucking amazing in that. Anyhow, um, Dreaming in Cuban, not my favorite book of the year. Definitely the winner here. Um, I liked it more than Devil in a Blue Dress. And, you know, I'll talk more about Dreaming in Cuban. It wins. Okay, so there you go. Um, Songs of Starlight versus Colorless Tsukuru Tazaki. Um, Songs of Starlight is a book by a local author out here in New Jersey named Brian Andreas. The book is just full of like little poems and aphorisms, and it's got like these playful little paintings that go with it. It's lovely, but it's not going to stay with me the way that Tsukuru Tazaki does. In that book, he is a young man. Um, he has a circle of friends. All of the other friends in the circle have. Uh, names that translate into a word that includes a color, except for him. That's why he's colorless. Anyhow, that's the explanation of that. They're all a group of great friends. They go off to college, they come back, and they're all expecting to get back together. Um, and when he reaches out to his friends, they all refuse to speak to him. He's heartbroken. He's basically cast out of the group. He moves on with his life. And then as an adult, he reconnects and finds out that one of the group accused him of raping her. So the rest of the group stopped associating with him and the book is about him reconstructing like what happened and he definitely didn't do it right maybe i 
no, but like in his dreams, he has sexual thoughts about the woman and the woman got murdered. So something really horrible has happened, but it wasn't him. And yet there's this doubling of selves that happens. It, it's really a great book and very complicated. And it really leaves a lot of things unanswered, but it's definitely worth the journey and absolutely the winner here. No hand, no questions. It's really hands down, just great. Um, Project Hail Mary versus Chaos. These are really even rematched uh, reading experiences. Both are excellent and incredibly different. Hail Mary, uh, recommended by the astonishing Kate Niet, is the story of a scientist who travels to a distant star to figure out how to stop a cosmic virus from eating our sun and effectively ending all life on Earth forever. So that's the story. Chaos, on the other hand, is about Charles Manson and the CIA, which is weird as hell. And this book is fucking bananas. It starts off um, with the author, Tom O'Neill. He's about to write uh, um, on a writing assignment, and he's going to do something about the Manson murders, and then it grows into this 10-year investigation that ends up exploring mind control in the CIA in the 60s and the 70s and how everyone was interconnected in the West Coast, including Manson and his victims. And it's fucking crazy conspiracy type stuff. But because he's a really great journalist, he just pulls back from tinfoil hat type stuff. And unfortunately, because he insists on being really, really, really a great journalist, he's never able to quite tie everything into a neat bow. Um, reality is just a really fickle bitch and, um, he's not able to make it a satisfying thing by proving the stuff that feels like it's just out of reach. On the other hand, Hail Mary is a book that has a fantastic ending, incredibly satisfying. That one wins here, but they're both really great and just weird that that's how they paired up. Anyhow, oh boy. Okay. Grief recovery handbook versus... Daughter of Dr. Moreau. I debated whether or not to include this, but I did read it. So full disclosure, at the end of last year, my ex-wife passed away. Um, she was the mother of my kids, and it's been a tough year. It is an interesting fact of humanity that this experience of loss, death, grief, it is the one single guaranteed thing that every single one of us on earth is going to share. We are all going to lose someone we love. If we haven't already you will and get this book it's a big help um it's a lot of work it's a tough read but it's really worth it and um if you have kids like i do then it's really worth it uh it, it was good to read it i don't want to read it again but it was good on the other hand daughter of dr moreau recommended by my absolute favorite ninja melis robinson uh, is an interesting twist on the old story from H.G. Wells about the island of freaks where this scientist, Dr. Moreau, mutates animals and humans into these unspeakable creatures who, it turns out, suffer, like, a lot. So this book uh, really plays a lovely twist on it with his daughter as a central figure. Um, it's a really quick read, super page turner, and the winner here. Uh, Witch Moon, Spider King versus Clara and the Sun. Clara and the Sun is a really good book. But I kept getting frustrated by this aching feeling that information is being withheld from me. And I get it. That's how storytelling works. You lay out the pieces of information and you feed them to the audience or the reader in a certain order to create an experience. But in this book, I just felt manipulated by it. And I just was, I had a frustrating experience. It's about um, an AI doll who's been purchased to be a companion for this child who's incredibly unwell. And there's something more sinister going on, sort of, underneath the surface. It's really a worthwhile book, but I cannot recommend it over Witch Moon Spider King. Uh, Witch Moon Spider King is part two of the Dark Star trilogy. Marlon James, uh, one of my favorite authors of all time, is uh, was at one point, he was just really frustrated with fantasy stories that had like no black people in it. And so he said, fuck it, I'll just create my own. And that's what he did. Um, this is all like super inspired by African folklore and myth, and the first book was definitely a difficult read. Um, and Marlon James can be hard anyhow because of the way that he writes the language, but also throw in an unreliable narrator in the first book. Yeah, it made it hard. This was a way more straightforward read, and it's fucking great. Clears up some of the confusion for the first one because Tracker shows up again in this, but in different circumstances but anyhow the main characters are absolutely fucking amazing the central woman the witch is one of the most badass female-centric amazing pieces of literature i've ever seen aside from maybe i don't know the book of night women you know by marlon james so 
definitely clear winner on this one here. Next one, Dial of Statistics versus Passenger. Um, Dial of Statistics is an interesting little book about the philosophy of math. And weirdly enough, kind of in a strange way, so is the passenger. Um, there's a lot of math and physics in this book, and there's long passages about what constitutes reality, what constitutes visions. There's a lot of madness, a lot of loneliness, and all of this uh, from a central character who he's a salvage diver and he sees a crashed plane at the bottom of uh, the ocean and there's a passenger from the title that's missing from the plane, just not there. So he finds himself being pursued by the, I don't know, the government or something. They seize his money, his possessions, and he just dives into this world of being a hermit where he really just examines his relationships in his life uh, with his sister that I mentioned before who committed suicide, his dad who worked on building the atomic bomb, what it means to be alone in the world, like truly alone, like, you know, really alone, like eating roadkill and living in a shack on a beach while hallucinating in a thunderstorm, that kind of stuff. It's intense. It's stark. It's fucking gorgeous and spare and sprawling all at the same time. Cormac McCarthy is a gift to the universe. I fucking love this book. Josephine Baker's Last Dance versus Blackmailer. Another recommendation. I mentioned Gamal before. He specifically recommended this book to me. It's way better than Blackmailer, which was overwhelmingly the biggest disappointment of the year. A big fan of the hard case crime series. I love the lurid covers. I love the pulp stories. I love all that crime shit. But this one was just fucking too simple and far-fetched. Uh, it just don't read it. It's not worth the energy. I don't want to talk it through. Uh, Mrs. Baker, a you win. Next book, Luminous Things versus The Lincoln Highway. Luminous Things is a great collection of poetry. Um, I've talked about poetry and collections in book form. This one's great. And if you're not a poetry reader, this is your book. Seriously, it's a great sampling of poetry from around the world, and it's curated by two-time Nobel Prize winner Cheslav Milos, whom I just love. Um, Subject-wise, it's all over the map, but you are in good hands. Milos gives like a brief intro to each poem and the poet for context, a little biography, a little bit of history, gives it meaning, and it's just a wonderful sampling from poetry around the world. I love this book. It's great. Lincoln Highway is from Amor Towles. You know, like what Fonzie needs when he stays at a hotel. Hey, more towels. Uh, his writing is just like fucking sliding through silk. This guy, he's a master. He really, really is. Gentleman Moscow was one of my favorite books from last year. This is not as great as that, but it is still oh, just in a great example of a really fine writing. And it's clearly, um, it's just a winner here. I loved it. Poetry collections can be all over the place and it's difficult to evaluate it as a book. So Luminous Things is amazing. Everyone should read it, but um, it just had bad luck in this pairing. Uh, sorry, but uh, Lincoln Highway is the winner here. Next, Man's Search for Meaning versus the Bhagavad Gita. Well, they're both the search for meaning. Frankl's book is rough, <laughs> as all Holocaust books are, but this one um, is about light in the darkness, and it's more about finding your purpose in life uh, as a guiding light through... <sighs> any situation and he uses the holocaust as the set piece nightmare um and it's it's really great it's it really is um strangely enough though it's paired up against the bhagavad gita who also is about that um that story is that prince arjuna is on a battlefield and he questions why why are we killing these people on the other side uh those guys deserve to live don't they what glory is there in killing so krishna starts laying out what it means to exist on a higher spiritual plane of man. It's not about killing or battle, but who you are in relation to the spiritual world. It's really great. So it's definitely, you know, worth reading, but um, Frankel wins in this one. Um, Bhagavad Gita really surprised me that it was much more readable than I thought it was going to be. Um, I'm glad that I read it. Um, but Frankel's book is just so, like, just gut-wrenching and immediate. It is not a mythical battlefield with gods and charioteers. Instead, it's a concentration camp. But it's really inspiring, so it's definitely the winner here, but definitely give Bhagavad Gita a try. Oh my lord, round three. Can you believe it? Um, if you're still with me, God bless you. Uh, white Whale versus White Tears. Oh boy. Okay, um, I really like Hari Kunzru. I hope I'm saying his name right. Um, I read Red Pill last year. I love that book, so I picked up this one. Really interesting author. I liked White Tears even more than Red Pill. It's strange. It's kind of supernatural, maybe. Um, I don't know, but it's this amazing deep dive into art, 
who owns what aspect of it? If you own the only recording of an artist who's long dead, do you own that art? What if there's a fire and the only copy gets destroyed? Has that artist and their existence been erased? And what if, what if that recording is fake? And, you know, were those African-American geniuses ever rewarded literally for creating an entire genre of music, uniquely American, painful, beautiful, amazing, miraculous, popular? I, are white people allowed to love it? Can you be part of this thing? I, I don't really know, but this book doesn't answer those questions, just dives into it and gives you a story to impose these thoughts on. And it's really, really great. I really recommend this. But <sighs> Moby Dick, again, you know what? It's just out there. Um, it creates a whole fucking universe in an incredibly cosmic and encompassing way, but it's also graspable. Uh, it's renegades and misfits. Uh, they're all on this crew, and they're brought together by this compelling, charismatic, very dark leader. Yeah, he's leading them to doom, but they're all literally on the same boat, and this guy's ambition is going to drive them to their doom, but I don't know. There's a golden coin nailed to the wall, so everyone's along for the ride. I don't know, man. What could be more American than the capitalistic adventure story with an insane leader at the helm? I don't know. It's kind of fucking amazing, you know? So uh, everyone collectively ignores their best instincts, and they're on this crew on this insane journey, and everyone knows they're doomed, but they still fucking go. I don't know. It's really great. I love it. So white whale it is um next oh, poppy i love you but uh mr whitehead is a master craftsman this book is just fucking beautiful it's one of my favorites of the year it is a fantastic page turner um it's also a window into harlem life in the 60s with all of its humanity and crime and corruption it's just great everyone should read this also read blood honey um i love poppy i can't wait for her next book but harlem shuffle is just fucking a masterwork definitely read that book it's great uh, next, second place, is a very slim book by a brilliant woman. Daniel Deronda is a very thick book, also by a brilliant woman. Um, I love Rachel Cusk. I really, really do. She is casually brilliant and inspiring, and I hope she writes a thousand books like this, really. But this year, Daniel Deronda was just a really unexpected and great experience. Um, I'm not Jewish, but the love of my life is. So I find myself in really deep and meaningful discussions just in my personal life about Jewish identity, what that means, um, especially in an age of rising anti-Semitism. And then along comes this book from 1876, grappling with identity in an incredibly elegant, thoughtful way, and it's remarkably controlled narrative, just unexpected twists and turns. I loved both of these books, but I think that Daniel Deronda is just going to stay with me longer. So that's the winner here. Um, next on to Bright Dead Things versus Dreaming in Cuban. A very strange matchup. Um, both of these were excellent, um, and I usually find individual poems to be more meaningful and stand out. Books of poetry can kind of be too much. We talked about that. But this is a really slim volume, and it feels just right. Ada Limon is like the poet of everyday things and what it means to be human in like a physical and immediate sense. Um, I heard her described once as uh, the poet of what it's like to be at a bar with a friend at three o'clock in the morning. She writes about a poem about pissing in a garage. Um, she's just fucking great and really connectable. Um, Dreaming in Cuban is a really, really nice um, examination of uh, a mother-daughter relationship um, that is stressed by the Cuban uh, revolution. And it really is nice. It's a really nice window into a world I know nothing about. Um, it's just, I, on this one, I gotta go <sighs> Bright Dead Things. Sorry, um, Dreaming Cuban really is a very nice book, but I, I have to say I kind of like the poetry better in this one, so a little weird, but that's how it went. Next, we're back to the top for Hail Mary versus Colorless. These are both really great. All right, so <sighs> remember how I didn't love the aliens in Sparrow? Well, the alien here is great. All right, we meet our main character, the human character, um, as he is on his way to a distant star to figure out how to save the Earth. Along the journey, the rest of the crew dies. So he is the only person who survives. He is all of humanity's hope, the Hail Mary. Um, and so the stakes are really high. And out there, as he gets close, he meets a very strange alien. And it's creepy and disgusting and disarming and foreign and scary. But they eventually figure out how to communicate and it's fucking great. Um, I loved every detail. It turns out that this alien is also there, sent from his planet to try and figure out a solution to the same problem that's destroying his son. 
Um, so they have a common goal. They work together. It is amazing. On the other hand, Colorless Takuro Tsuzaki is really moving and human. It's probably a better piece of literature for whatever that's worth. But I think my personal experience with reading these two books, I got to go Project Hail Mary. That's the winner. Next, Dr. Moreau versus Witch Moon Spider King. It's not no contest. Witch Moon Spider King. Don't get me wrong. I enjoyed Dr. Moreau um, or the daughter of Dr. Moreau, but the sheer sprawling ambition of Witch Moon Spider King, the fierce, inexhaustible energy of a main character. It, she is amazing. This has a, uh, um, this character is so brutal and passionate and full of rage and love and anger. There's tribal politics. There's magic shapeshifters. It's sexy as fuck. It's intense, dark. I love this book. Clear winner. Next, Passenger versus Josephine Baker. Josephine Baker, amazing woman. This book is really interesting. It's well-paced. It's informative. It Maybe interested in the upcoming project where I'm pretty sure Janelle Monet is going to play her. So if that is correct, I feel like I saw that online someplace. Yes, bring that the fuck on. I'm on board. That is awesome. I can't wait for that. But I'm really sorry, but this book is up against Cormac McCarthy. He's a towering fucking genius. So Passenger wins this round. Um, at the end of this round, we got a Mortals versus Victor Frankel. Uh, Man's Search for Meaning is revered as one of the most life-changing books ever written. It's on everybody's top 100 books to read before you die, and it totally deserves to be there, without question. But The Lincoln Highway, it's just more fucking enjoyable. I love these people. I love how they're trying to be good and decent, even like the sort of the wily one who's like the ne'er-do-well. He's charming as hell, and yeah, he fucks up. And sure, I that, we've sort of seen that rakish character before, but man, rarely is it done so perfectly. Just absolutely gorgeous writing. This book was a joy. Do yourself a favor and read it. Seriously. Okay, here we are, people. We are coming down home stretch. Okay, fuck. Moby Dick versus Harlem Shuffle. Harlem Shuffle is so good. It's so good. And Moby Dick is a venerable classic for very, very good reasons. It deals with every aspect of the human condition in some way, shape, or form. Crime, greed, capitalism, lies, truth, nature, madness, God, religion, everything is there. Except for one thing. Women. This book has no women. I mean, they're they're in the church scene in like chapter two, but it's like they're not meaningful. It, it they have like no presence at all. Their like job is to stay home and wait for the men to return. There are fucking long, long passages about dolphins, but not about women, and that's fucking weird. That's a huge blind spot in this amazingly brilliant book. Um, so great as it is and boring in lots of places, um, condition that Mr. Whitehead's writing does not suffer from. I tell you, I love Moby Dick and I'll always sing its praises, but this experience, um, of reading, I gotta give it to Harlem Shuffle. It's just fucking incredible. It's really, really great. Ugh, stacking up one against the other. Harlem Shuffle is just, it's the winner. So there you go. That's that. Now, Danny D versus, um, Ada Limon. I go Daniel Deronda, okay? Ada Limon's amazing. It, even she says that the currency of poetry is a single poem. So that's it. You should just stand alone. Pick one of them. Read it. Enjoy it. Drink it in. Let it sit with you for the day. Read it in the morning over coffee. She's fucking great. And then put the book down. Don't read it like I did, like a fucking idiot, and read it like a book. Read it one at a time and let those things wash over you. They'll come back to you better. You're, you're much better off doing that. Be smart. Don't be me. Um, so it's not fair to compare this or really any artistic endeavor to another, but that's kind of what we're doing here. So there you go. This is about my personal experience. That leans towards George Eliot. Danny D, you're the winner. Next, Hail Mary versus Witch Moon Spider King. These are both great reads, but you cannot fucking deny what Mr. James is doing in this trilogy. Uh, there's two of three that are out. It is breathtaking. It is huge and ambitious and a fucking love this. I cannot wait for the third one. I really, really do. The second one was better than the first one. It's great. But please do read Project Hail Mary. Thank you, Kate, for the recommendation. I loved it. So just uh, Witch Moon Spider King is the winner. Next, god damn it, fucking Cormac McCarthy versus Amor Tals. God damn it. Lincoln Highway made me feel so good about relationships and the power of storytelling. Oh, and this amazingly beautiful stylistic technique of his writing. It's just fucking gorgeous. Uh, the Passenger was 
you know, a tough read where literally the title refers to a red herring. <laughs> you know what I mean? The missing passenger in the novel, that's not what it's about. Like, it's about other stuff. It's a deep dive into regret and loneliness and madness, and the nature of reality. And if you're, man, if that's what you're going for in your book, you are swinging for the fences. I fucking love that. Um, so it's going to get my vote, but just by a hair. I love both of these books. They're both amazing, but Cormac McCarthy, you win. Next is Harlem Shuffle versus Daniel Deronda. Ugh, Jesus Christ. I think I have to go Daniel Deronda here because maybe I just was personally more surprised by my own personal journey of reading that book. I mean, I love Harlem Shuffle. I really did. But Daniel Deronda was just exquisitely observed. Um, and it's delicate, and it's like holding fine china. The structure was really delicate, and I loved how the characters wove in and out of each other's lives. It's a long read, and it's slow, but it's really worth it. Um, I have to say, yeah, George Eliot for the win. Oh, God damn it. Fucking Marlon James versus Cormac McCarthy. Uh, all right, I gotta go Marlon James. You know, I love this book. And I love the vision of it. It's fucking, what he's going for is so goddamned awesome to be like a fantasy novel and a religious and political and spiritual. And it's about rape survival and gay characters kicking ass and shape-shifting characters and sex and violence. And it's also about the little details of happiness and joy and peace and quiet. And it's just everything. I love it. So, God damn it, fucking hey, Marlon James, you win. All right. And now, the winner the 2022 reading list thunderdome highlander there can be only one combat is <sighs> it's marlon james yeah uh going into this my gut feeling was it was going to be daniel deronda um i it, it's really great i loved it um but as i was going along in creating this stupid piece that you've been patient enough to hang with for however long it's been um the ending resolution with the gwyneth character it's a bit too easy um, everything else was so really earned that the way that that rolls itself out didn't, it didn't feel as earned as the rest of it, and it was a little too neat. Witch Moon Spider King just felt like it might have ended in several different places, but in that situation, Marlon James kept bringing me back and reminding the reader that like nope there's this other thing oh no there's this other thing and you got to deal with this and you got to deal and all of these unresolved things that are central characters and the story can't be completed until we do this other adventure and then this other thing and it happens multiple times and it's never boring and it just reminds you that <sighs> these characters are complicated and the experiences they have and the connections they have are complicated and real and it's really really never boring and uh, it is my vote for the book of the year for me so happy new year we'll see you next year with more books and crap and that's it happy new year love you guys see ya